Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in. Again, I am Kaylee Bateman, the Content Director at She Can Code, and today we're discussing careers in tech, stepping into cyber security. In this episode, we're going to dive into the dynamic realm of cybersecurity, a field at the forefront of safeguarding our digital future. And I've got the amazing Sonia Kumar, Global Head of Cyber Defense at Element Materials Technology, who is here to share her own personal journey offer her invaluable insights and offer some advice on breaking into this rapidly evolving field and all of her experience of stepping into a leadership role. Welcome, Sonia. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Kaylee, for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Can we kick off with a little bit about yourself, please? We've got a lot to cover today, but it'd be great to kick off with a little bit of background about you. Yeah. So um, stop me if I go on for too long, but um, so I'm currently the Global Head of Cyber Defence for Element Materials, just to let uh, our listeners know um, what we do. So Element Materials, we're basically uh, 300 laboratories around the world with one of the biggest organisations in the testing, inspection and certification sector. Uh, And we do all that for nuclear, aerospace defence, pharmaceutical industry, connected technologies, pretty much any company you've heard of, you can guarantee Element is in the background somewhere. So I came into that role in May as the head of cyber defense. And my job is to build from scratch a 24-7 cyber defense capability. So I'm I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Uh, But I came from seven years in Vodafone Group, where I led the global cyber defense incident management team. <clears throat> and that was basically, I was accountable for our global collective response to big cyber attacks at Vodafone. And, um, but before that, um, I came from 16 years in government, a long time in um, intelligence and security for government, uh, which was great. So I made the jump to the private sector about eight years ago. Um, And what I should say, actually, because it's relevant for for our listeners, is that I moved into cybersecurity eight years ago with no cyber background, no IT background, no certifications, not technical, a bit of a gamble that Vodafone took on me, which is great and has paid off. But, uh, you know, again, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, but uh, good things can happen with determination. So. So that was that. And and actually, um, I went to university in Edinburgh and graduated with uh, an honours degree in biomedical sciences. So I was a scientist at heart um, and I went off after um, university. I took a bit of time out, mucked about and then went off to be an, um, a trainee expert witness. Um, so a forensic scientist for three years um, training in sexually motivated crime and DNA interpretation. So. I've come on a bit of a journey, uh, I would say, Kaylee, to get where I am today. Yeah. Um, yes, but it's been a great one. I, I, I love that. I love um, that you've you've got a brilliant journey and you're absolutely right. Our, our listeners love to hear that you can come in at any point with any background and you don't have to be technical and you can just fall into the tech industry. Um, and, and I mean, you're from a STEM background and we have lots of ladies that have studied similar subjects to yourself and then later they think you know what I'm gonna um, go into the tech industry and it's something on this podcast that we talk about often more people should know that you can do that that you can transition into the tech sector and you I mean your job it sounds like it's um, it, it would be technical and you would have to have lots of technical skills and have come from a computer science background also it just sounds super cool the way that you describe your job is just so cool and I think a lot of people would think oh no I have to have you know, certain qualifications to to get into a job that is that cool and that you make such an impact. I mean, the way you described even working at Vodafone and you were like stopping big cyber attacks. Like, did you think, you know, eight years ago when you when you went into this area, did, did you think that you would be saying those words, like that you stopped big cyber attacks happening at big companies? No, no, I didn't, you know. And then <clears throat> how I got into cyber, I like I said, I was in, in government, and at the time I was working with the military very closely and I was working on a military base um, about eight, nine years ago. And everyone was talking about cyber warfare and cyber this and, and I get FOMO. So for those of you who don't know what that is, it's like fear of missing out. I like to be in the mix. And I was like, what is this cyber stuff? I want to do it. And I remember somebody said, oh, well, you know, you can't. You need these certifications. You need to be technical. Um, and actually that made me more determined to think, right, I am going to go and do that. Um, 
and I, I took up a master's uh, in um, cyber defense and information assurance, which actually, on reflection, I probably didn't need, to be honest. Um, but it was a bit of a joke. And I sent my CV off to, off to uh, Vodafone and another company for two jobs that I thought I wasn't qualified to do. Um, and actually, like I say, uh, Vodafone took a bit of a gamble. They must have seen something. I had a good background in risk. Um, and intelligence and they um, placed me in the threat intelligence team in the cyber threat intelligence team as an analyst so you know ne never having done any cyber uh, just learned very quickly had a real passion for it and kind of progressed from there so so you're right Kaylee uh, I, I, I you know you don't have to write code you don't have to be a technical expert you can be if that's what you choose to to go into but um, it's it's you know you need to have common sense a uh, very logical approach to things. And it helps if you can understand risk, I would say as well. Um, yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, and so today's discussion is about um, stepping into the cybersecurity uh, industry. Um, so can we kick off a little bit with a brief overview of the current landscape of cybersecurity and its significance in the tech industry? Yeah, I think, I think, um, yeah, I think you have to think about the significance of the tech industry first, right? So why is the tech industry so important? Well, there's nothing that technology doesn't touch, right? We know that. Um, and then we'll focus on the UK. I was reading something that was really interesting in terms of the global tech sector. The UK came in last year at number one in Europe and number three in the world behind US and China. And that is amazing. So the tech sector globally and in the UK is having a massive positive impact on revenue, and growth, on people, society. So it's very important. Um, it's also becoming a hub for something called Impact Tech, which are companies that create technological solutions to reach the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are very important, as we all know. So we want to protect that sector. Uh, and if we strip things back and think about what cybersecurity is, that's protecting that infrastructure, the data that sits on that infrastructure, the connected technology, the systems, right? We want to protect all that. We want to protect our people from harm and society. So what's that got to do with the cybersecurity threat landscape? Now, you can go online uh, and read lots of reports about the, the threat landscape. I'm going to maybe just pick on some things that I've seen. Um, and that I've noticed. So um, I've definitely over the past sort of year or two seen an increase in um, an impact through attacks on the supply chain. So, so either through suppliers, partners, business customers. <clears throat> and to give an example, Kaylee, let's imagine I'm a big organization and you're a big organization. Uh, you're my uh, customer and you, you suffer from big ransomware attack. What the attackers might be doing is attacking your systems to actually get access to my data in my organization. And we're seeing a, a definite significant increase in those types of attacks. And then social engineering, you know, tricking people into doing stuff that's been there for ages, that's still there, particularly phishing attacks. Um, and people are becoming more and more aware of, of those attacks, um, but they'll, they'll always be there and be there in the future. Um, and then the other thing that I've picked out is something called the insider threat. So that's where you might have somebody who works uh, in an organization and they might accidentally do something to cause a cyber incident or, or they might do something maliciously with intent. So I, I've sort of seen those things in terms of the recent landscape. And then the last thing um, to pick out is probably attackers these days, they don't need to be sophisticated. They don't need to be big nation state sponsored groups from China or from Russia or North Korea or whatever. Um, if we think about um, something quite recent, there's a group called Lapsus. They were based predominantly in uh, Brazil and the UK, and they were teenagers, very young, a very young group of people under 16, um, mostly, and they brought down global organizations through their cyber attacks. So, so if you take all that, that's that's the landscape. We talk about the significance of the tech sector. That's why they're all relevant and connected, and that's why we want to protect the tech sector. 
Yes, definitely. And it sounds as though like you're 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 a part of such a big mission there, like not just within your company, but as a whole. And the way that you describe and the the way that you work, and you said like uh, use the word protection and um, are all of those things as well. Because I wanted to ask you a little bit about why you came into cybersecurity. You mentioned before you had FOMO. Did you also think as well that you make such an impact in cybersecurity that like you can really see the difference that you make in the things that you do? Is that something that kind of drew you to, to the industry that you can, you know, you can actually protect people and protect not just systems, but people. You can see what you're doing day to day makes a big difference. Yeah, I've done I've done that since uh, I graduated, as, as we talked about. So went from forensic science um, you know, as a trainee expert witness, you know, protecting people through forensics and then moving into government um, security and intelligence, always driven by this desire to protect and defend our society. Um, and I guess that's why cybersecurity drew me in as well for, for the same reasons. I'm very passionate about protecting people uh, generally, always have been since I was younger. So, uh, yeah. 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 I think in technology as well, people can really struggle to see um, that they'll be making such a difference as well. I think, you know, you come in, you might work for a tech company, probably um, work on your own. And there isn't they, they can't always make that um, real world connection. Whereas in cyber, actually, that's quite an easy uh, connection. Most tech roles do make an impact. It's just connecting the dots sometimes and showing people um, what they do. But cyber is one of those industries where you can say, you know, this this is this is what I did and, and the um, difference that I'm making. Um, it's far, far easier. Um, we uh, are going to touch upon uh, leadership a little bit today um, and you're moving to a leadership role. How do you define effective leadership in the realm of cyber defence? Um, I think effective leadership is not too different within cyber defense than it is anywhere else is the first thing I'd say. There are nuances which we can talk about. Um, but I think to start with, specifically with cyber defense, being a cyber defender, that's what I like to call us. It's really it is tough. It is tough. Um, it's a fast paced, pressured environment. You have to work sometimes long hours at speed. Um, to give you an example, if you're dealing with a cyber attack, you don't know when that attack's going to end. Um, and as an example, um, I've had to deal with an, uh, an, an attack that lasted over a year. So um, it can it can be tough. So you're protecting, you're responding, you're defending. And and yes, as a leader, you know we have advanced technologies at our fingertips, but ultimately we can't do anything without our people. That's what I always yeah. think of people. Um, and I expect trust and integrity from others. And so as a leader, I, others should expect that from me, right? So really, really important. And I think from my experience within cyber and cyber defense is people and my teams really want to feel and know that I've got their back no matter what. So, cause we're making some tough risk-based decisions all the time at speed. And what the teams that I lead don't want to feel like is that um, I'm going to blame them if they make a mistake um, uh, and I really do have their back, you know, no matter what, and the buck stops with me. So I think that's part of really good leadership within cyber defense. Um, and then throwing the, them under the bus. It was them. Well, I didn't tell them to well, do I, it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've seen it, you know, I've seen other yeah. leaders do that. So um, I very much try to be accountable. Um, and so and people can make I've made mistakes right and I've had great leaders uh, who supported me through those mistakes so I try to do the same and then my views have changed over the years of being a leader I used to think and I used to say if you'd asked asked me this question 10 years ago I'd say oh being a good leader is treating everyone the same actually it's I, I'd say it's different now being a good leader is about treating everyone fairly but differently if needed because people are different and actually yeah. you, you might have to treat them differently to be a good leader um and then it would be remiss of me not to talk about building an inclusive culture and I but I don't think all leaders know what that means and I just I think really simply I'm quite passionate about this all it is it's it's you know people look up to you as a leader and it's just making sure you don't do anything or say anything or participate in anything that might make anyone feel uncomfortable that's for me that's all an inclusive culture is those things um, 
because if you do do that as a leader people won't be able to be themselves and then I guarantee they won't be able to perform to the best of their abilities if they can't be themselves so that's really important in cyber defense um, and diversity of thought and then the other thing I think is important and again very passionate about this one I'm doing quite a bit of work on this is as a leader don't be a passive bystander um, people are looking up to you and you know you can it doesn't mean you have to be confrontational but challenge things that are inappropriate challenge behaviors that shouldn't happen or anything that shouldn't happen be that be that role model and then be authentic I think um, you know I've had great teams uh, working with me because I'm very much authentic everybody knows where they stand with me whether that can be a good or bad thing at times um, and I think if being authentic means showing your vulnerable side particularly in those operational fast-paced environments and that's fine as well and I, you know I, I've cried several times in front of teams my leaders um, and I think people appreciate seeing a vulnerable and a sort of human side uh, to a senior leader and then the last thing, this really other important thing is just have a bit of fun. You don't have to be serious all the time. Honestly, it doesn't mean you have to be inappropriate, but you can you can be, be working in a very serious environment, but you can take the edge off by having a bit of fun as well. So for me as leaders, or as a leader in cyber defense, all those things um, are important. And I just, I just want to say one thing, because I recently, like six months ago, joined Element. <clears throat> And they're really committed to cultivating a, a culture of psychological safety. We've all heard that term. Um, yeah. And today, it's a coincidence, today is the start of the focus groups that they're running. And hopefully I can get to that later on. Um, and uh, what we're going to do at Element is resurge what we call the colleague resource networks. And each of those networks um, will represent um, or stand for an under underrepresented community. So there's going to be a lot of work within Element. And I, I think why I'm saying that is, is for people who are listening and can take away ideas and do things in their organisation, right? And, um, yeah, I think uh, all, all those things will help being a leader in cyber security and cyber defence. Definitely. I I completely, I love everything that you just said. Um, I think that uh, as well, all of those things come together to create a culture. It's sometimes I think people think, oh, it's a tick box of things that I have to do. But one important thing that you said was being that role model as well, because it does trickle down from the top. And if you're not pointing things out and you're not leading the way, that culture that you're looking for, it just it just can't be created amongst your team. So um, you're right, it is a mixture of lots of different things that creates uh, a really good culture at a company, um, not just one or two things. And normally it's how you feel coming to work every day. It's not, you know, I, oh, my employer ticked a box, we have a D and I group or whatever it may be, but actually it's how you feel every day when you're working um, and whether or not you uh, feel comfortable or you can approach your, your manager if you need to approach them about something. I mean, all of that takes a lot of hard work and commitment, um, as, as you know. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you a little bit about challenges because uh, we we covered a few off there um, about challenges of uh, being a leader um, in this field. Um, is, is there anything that you kind of, even before you stepped into this leadership role, were there any challenges that you you now realise that perhaps you, you didn't see before? I mean, we have ladies on here always tell me, you know what, when I got into a leadership role, I thought everybody expected me to have the answer to everything. <laughs> I got in the role and realised that's what my team is for. You know, there are there challenges that you kind of face every day? Um, yeah, I, I, I think I'm trying to think what, what are they that stand out? So definitely what you've just said and, and we can come on to that but um in terms of being in a leadership role it's we touched on it right it's attracting talent so we know uh there's a skills gap in cyber security it's widely acknowledged there aren't enough people to do uh jobs within cyber security um and i'm at the moment i'm trying to build a global cyber defense capability as we mentioned and just struggling to to get those candidates because there are you know less jobs in the number of candidates so that's one but moreover it's attracting diverse talent 
so retaining them is the other thing <laughs> yeah so so I I don't have a team well, I do have a team but I'm building them so we're starting from scratch which is great so I don't have the retention issue yet um and hopefully won't have but I would like to see more diversity on the candidate plate and I'm struggling to see that um and to be honest it's it's nearly all men which is fine there's some great talent um um, but I would like to see a more diverse candidate plate. So that's a real challenge at the moment, quite timely. Yes. Um, going back to what you said, yeah, I, I, you know, I still have it, those moments of doubt and thinking that I had to know everything and, but I've become less, less so, my, my thinking is less of that now actually. And, um, you know, I think if we can uh, attract good talent build great teams and that's what they're there for we hire great people to do great things right so so that's fine I think one of the challenges uh, at the moment is you know I've come into this role uh, cyber is quite new for the organization it's a new function um, and it's trying to continuously and positively um, promote a cultural shift towards a more cyber secure mindset so to give you an example, in my previous role, because I was uh, coordinating our collective response to cyber attacks, people would just see me as a harbinger of doom. So if I asked to have a call with someone or message them on Teams, I could literally hear them going, oh, no, what do you want? Uh, you know, and actually, I might just be wanting to just chat about anything or have a coffee. Right. But yeah. <laughs> and and it's trying to it's trying to get people to see actually we're not harbingers of doom in cybersecurity you know we're, we're we're trying to be enablers we're not there to stop you from doing what you need to do but we just want you to do it a bit more safely and securely that's all we're yeah. asking so that, that's one of the challenges at the moment people that really want to be helpful but they see they see you with a big stick and I, and I want to try and change that mindset it's funny, isn't it, with the um, stereotypes, especially in cybersecurity, because you are right, of people, if you were to call people, they think, oh, my God, have I done something wrong? Am, am I doing something wrong? Um, and also in terms of um, the imagery, we've we've touched upon that uh, on this podcast before. When you see images of hackers, it's always a guy with his hood up. And when you're saying I'm struggling to find diversity in terms of candidates, I think some of that is just down to who we think the hackers are. Um, and that just doesn't always attract a female candidates into to the industry as well. You almost think of it as a a male industry, male hackers, and 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 also men that are defending um, against the hackers as well. So all of that just kind of it doesn't help. There are so many stereotypes around cybersecurity. Um, also, uh, another great one that I heard uh, in previous years that you're all incredibly paranoid as individuals. Is that true? <laughs> um, I probably to be honest, I, I think. Uh, well, I, for me, everyone calls me a disaster thinker, but. Um, <laughs> It's because it's my job to think of the worst case scenario. I think yeah, that's, that's not that's a bad it, thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so maybe another way of putting it is paranoid. But yeah, I've got to. I've always got to. And most people in cyber defense do have to think of the worst because you're thinking about risk and impact. Yeah, and, and you do have to think what is the worst outcome here and what is it we need to try and prevent or stop. Um, yeah. so yes, we are a little bit paranoid, I guess. Um, Conceptions and there are so many around the tech industry as a whole, um, anyway, which doesn't help get people into tech. Um, but lots more uh, interesting around cyber, um, which we we'll need to. We try to do our best on this podcast to dispel those myths um, of people that work in those certain areas. Um, can we talk a little bit about emerging trends? So, what are some emerging trends and technologies in cybersecurity that professionals should be aware of? Um, it's fast paced, isn't it? I mean. How do you keep up with that as well? <laughs> well, well, it blows my head off, to be honest. <laughs> if I'm and and I, what I was, what I should say, there's probably other people and other professionals that have a much better idea to answer this question, but I'll try. I'll try my best. I guess the obvious one is, and when we're talking about emerging trends and technologies, I'm thinking, because I am that harbinger of doom, disaster thinker, Kaylee, I'm thinking about threats and um, what the risks are, so threats and vulnerabilities and risks, really. So in that context, I guess the obvious thing, it would, you know, is, is uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now, I'm not an expert in those technologies, right? But what I, what I do worry about is the use of those technologies by attackers to do harm. Yeah. Um, it's, it's only be gonna, be going to become more sophisticated and easier 
for people to do those things so so that worries me quite a bit and I had this vision I don't know if you've seen Terminator 3 the rise of the machines I actually do think one day we're going to end up like that you know All these yeah. just like ruling the world and hopefully I'm wrong and that's not going to happen but that's that is how I see I see things going so um so there's that so there's so there's AI and machine learning um and then uh, the other couple of things I can think of is the Internet of Things. So just for people who aren't sure what that means, um, you know, the Internet or I Internet of Things or IoT, it's the network of connected devices equipped with sensor software or other technologies to gather, store and share data via the Internet. Um, and I'm sure we've all got IoT devices uh, now. Most of us should have, probably do have. And I was reading a study the other day um, and there's going to be, there's predicted I don't know, in a few years, 30 billion IoT connections, which equates to about four IoT devices per person on average. So the point being is um, there'll be attackers that are looking to exploit exploit IoT, um, so the Internet of Things. So that that's a worry. Um, and then the other thing I'd call out, just because I find it fascinating, uh, and again, I like to cite films as a way to relate things. You know, the Minority Report. I don't know if people have seen that with Tom Cruise, yeah. and it's all a bit yeah. um, fancy. But um, sort of behavioral biometrics, it's called. Now, we're, we should be familiar with physiological biometrics, and that's face recognition and fingerprints for logging into applications. And that relies on um, bodily traits to authenticate our identity. But behavioral biometrics data, um, that's a measurement of how we move and act. It's quite passive. It works in the background. It monitors our behavior uh, so that when we attempt to log in, for example, we'll be recognized from the way we move. That's quite frightening, quite great to think about, but quite frightening. And then other examples include um, our keystroke rhythm, our gait, as in the way we walk and move, voice recognition and the way we might use our mouse, for example. So, you know, all great things, all great technologies and, and going to do a lot of good in the world. But actually, the, the worry is what could what could bad people do with those technologies to cause harm? Yes, definitely, because I wanted to ask you a bit about the changing landscape of cybersecurity um, and, and how has it changed in the recent years and what do you anticipate for the future? And you touched upon it um, there as well. I think do you think the attackers have changed as well I mentioned you mentioned some of the technology um that has changed and some of the worries that the earlier you mentioned uh that that they were teenagers in Brazil that were hacking have the attackers changed have they become more sophisticated or <laughs> I don't know it's just, it's a debatable point I don't think so so you know if you if you if you were to categorize uh, attackers or threat actors you would have what we call loan actors so people work on their own do things on their own uh, serious organized crime groups, state sponsored groups, what we call advanced persistent threat groups as well, um, APT groups, um, and um, yeah, lots lots of other sort of attacker types as we call them. But I don't, I think they've always been around. I don't think they've changed. I just think what they're doing. So, so for example, we talked about lapses. You know, we had young people or hackers or whatever you want to call them 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But I think then they didn't really seek to bring down global organizations and probably didn't quite understand their potential because it's potential. Um, so I don't think it's changed too much. And in terms of the landscape, you said, how has it changed in recent years? Honestly, I don't think it's changed that much, really. Um, you know, we still talk about social engineering today, which we did 10 years ago. We still talk about ransomware and malware today, which we talked about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. We, I mentioned it before, the, the threat from insiders. We talk about it now. It's as irrelevant today as it was 10 years ago. We still talk about deception and fraud today. I just think, I just think the technologies are changing, but ultimately the landscape, it's essentially remaining the same and quite consistent in my that's just my opinion though um yeah 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 there's still still the same risk um yeah. you're never going to be out of a job that's a good thing right <laughs> no, hopefully not no unless it's unless the machines rise up and take over Kaylee then maybe oh, of course yeah I think we should do a whole podcast just on that um, <laughs> 
What about organisations? How can they ensure cyber resiliency and prepare for incidents uh, and mitigate risk? This is a difficult one. I I think for me, it depends on where an organisation is on their cyber security journey. So you can have small, medium, large enterprises, we call them, you know, so they're all going to be different in terms of trying to ensure their resiliency and preparing for risks. Um, but I think, you know, there's some good guidance. I would say for, for to answer that question as a whole, focus on the risk and the potential impact of the risk. Um, the organization needs to focus on what they want to protect. We often hear the term, I don't use it very much, but we often hear the term, you know, the crown jewels. But essentially what, what that means is what's most precious to that company, you know, whether it be data, whatever, systems, et cetera. So focus on that. And then I think in terms of preparation and mitigating risk, you know, for those of us who work in cyber and tech, we take for granted um, what people might know. So we, I would say we should be encouraging people in organizations to do what we call the cybersecurity basics. But how do people know what those basics are? So have policies and plans and guidance in place. Um, you know, we expect our colleagues in our workforce to implement cybersecurity basics, but where do they go if there isn't anything to, to guide them? Um, I think cyber awareness, so I've come into Element. Um, we've just, you know, in line with um, Cyber Awareness Month in October this month, um, just launched Element's very first cyber awareness campaign. And the feedback feedback from that across the globe is incredible, right? So we talked about the laboratories earlier on. They don't get that exposure to cybersecurity awareness, and they're getting that now. That's really helping. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, have the other thing is from my experience, I would suggest nearly all organizations whether they know it or not will experience a cyber attack or an incident a security incident of some kind um and definitely have a policy an incident response policy or an incident management policy in place and a plan in place it might not always go to plan but have something in place so that people can refer to um that's really really important and some excellent guidance out there on how to do that and then the other thing i would definitely recommend um, our cyber attack simulations or tabletop exercises there are different things um, and a great example of that I was lucky enough to come into element in May and in June I took our board our operating board through a destructive uh, simulated obviously destructive ransomware attack and the learnings that came out from that um, was incredible right and I think it was really it was invaluable to the business so Lots and lots of things that people can do, um, but they're just some of the things that I picked out that stand out to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, incredibly important, yeah, to, to simulate um, disaster. Is that how you got the disaster thinker uh, name? Um, by simulating what could happen, which is obviously invaluable, but perhaps that's where it came from. No, it's, 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 <laughs> you know, it's been, that label's been around for a good 10 plus years, Kaylee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um uh no so but actually it does help when you're designing um uh simulations and tabletop exercises because again you do have to think of the worst case scenario right that can happen yeah. um and make it make it easily understandable um sort of to executive board level as well so you know yeah. and you can do those at any level not just with the board um you can do them with your, those simulations with your technical teams whoever whichever stakeholder group you choose um just practicing practicing those scenarios really will will help now it's not um it's not a golden or a silver bullet as they call it in in the industry but it, it definitely will help so yeah yeah i mean that's another thing as well you mentioned nick uh communication a lot of people that work in tech think you know they're they they not people that work in tech that people that are outside of tech and looking in seem to think that you just um, you have to be highly technical and you don't really work with other people. And actually, in your job, you describe they're communicating to the board or to other teams um, about you know things that could happen. It's it's not just you sitting on your own, you know, fending off attackers. That so you you have a whole host of soft skills that come into the mix as well. 
Yeah, it's, that's, that's a really good point. So <clears throat> one of the things I say in cyber defense, no matter what role you do, whether it's a technical or less technical role, two things I say um, from my experience that will make somebody successful in role is uh, communication. Um, so being able to not, not just communicate in a good way, but being able to spin up technical language into easily understandable language and if you're in my team and someone's trying to explain something and it's a bit too technical what I always say to them and it's probably not too difficult for them to imagine I say imagine I'm your granny or imagine I'm your mum how would you how would you tell your granny and that seems to really work um and for the listeners I, I you know it's, it's a bit of it's a bit of a tip actually um so that's the first thing so communication and the second thing I would say is stakeholder or colleague management um if you can do those two things well the rest of your job will come easily i have found um and yes they are soft skills um so yeah absolutely right Brilliant. well um, i've got one more question i wanted to ask you we're almost out of time uh the tech industry has faced challenges obviously related to diversity and inclusion you mentioned yourself as well that you would like more diversity in the candidates that come uh, come forward um how is the cybersecurity field addressing these issues and what can be done uh, to promote a more diverse workforce do you think so i think the cybersecurity domain recognizes the issue which is always good so it's widely recognized um i think that we need to do more because the cybersecurity is not diverse and it's not inclusive that's the bottom line so we need yep. to do more <laughs> and i think for me personally it starts with what we talked about right create and you talked about it as well create that workplace culture where, where people from all walks of life want to come and be part of and and want to wake up in the morning and, and do their job that's the first thing if you oh, if you think like that, then you can't go wrong. Um, and then you know, again, if I, if I use Element as an example, uh, last month we launched something called the Accelerator Program for Women, um, and that's part of, of a commitment to getting thirty percent of women into leadership positions by twenty twenty five. So um, you know, you don't you don't necessarily have to do those initiatives related to women. It could be any any underrepresented re represented group, um, but really create those initiatives, drive them um, as much as you can, and you don't necessarily need to be in a leadership role to do that. To do that, um, and then um, there's other things. I'm trying to think about what I'm involved in. So I'm I'm part of something called the Empowering Women to Lead Cybersecurity in Scotland. Uh, program um, it's a unique leadership program for women in cyber security and it's delivered in association with the Scottish Digital Academy and Scottish government so that's a, a sort of local government led initiative and there are many more uh, for different groups of people so get involved in those impart your knowledge take what you learn back to the workplace to other organizations um, and actually to, to graduate in that program um, my group and I, some some of the other women in the group, have to do a big presentation in Edinburgh in December to, to lots of senior leaders across other organisations. And we've picked diversity and inclusion as our topic because it's so important to us. And it's not just yeah. about it's not just about gender or ethnicity. It's you know neurodiversity, it's sexuality, is everything. So so there's that, and then things like. Um, um, you know, there are there are initiatives sponsored by the UK National Cyber Security Centre uh, and UK government. There's something called Cyber 912. That's a national competition um, that looks for um, potential across universities in the UK, not just for technical roles in cyber, but for um, strategy based roles as well, because UK government recognises a skills shortage. So. Lots of different things to get involved in and do at, at lots of different levels, um, not not just by leaders, I would say. Get get involved. Uh, be Or if you don't want to get too involved, be an ally or be that active bystander or be that supportive person to someone who's going through a rough time, whatever. Right? Lots of things that you can get involved in and do. Yeah, it, you're absolutely right. So it's 
it's a whole host of things as well that goes on all year, not just one national day and that's it. And as a company, it sounds like you're working towards, you know, filling your year with lots of things um, that, that that is moving you in, in the right direction. And I love the fact that you said ally as well, because that is not always just females. And there are lots of male allies that come into that conversation and are really helping to try and move the needle there um, as well. So. Yeah, I couldn't agree more uh, with, there is definitely more to do, but lots is being done. Yes, there is always more to do. Yes. yes. Um, that is a lovely note to end it on because we're already out of time. Thank you so much. I could talk to you for another couple of hours on this topic. Um, it is such an interesting topic and um, it sounds like you have one of the coolest jobs that I've had on this podcast for some time. So thank you very much for taking <laughs> The time out of your day to come and have a chat with us. I'm sure our listeners um, are uh, going to love this and find it so, so useful if they're thinking about making that move into cybersecurity. Um, I think it, it's just hearing that you're not from a technical background is it going to be so useful to so many of our listeners. So thank you very much for joining Thanks. us. No, you're very welcome, Kaylee. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And to everybody listening, as always, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope to see you again next time.